Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Lancaster Rugby coach Stuart Lancaster. Stuart, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be on. Stuart, as we begin with every guest that comes on the show, could you please tell us your earliest sporting memory? Ooh, you got me there. Uh, early sporting memory probably would be playing football for Lang Mothby. Uh, uh, so I lived in a little village called Colgate in uh, Cumbria, which is just uh, on the border of England, Scotland, and the Lake District. And I played uh, football for Langworth be under eight. Um, I did lots of sports at uh, primary school. Uh, started playing cricket. Uh, but yeah, it's probably my, my earliest memory. Uh, yeah, it would be that. And I mean, before the podcast today, sure, you messaged me this morning at 7 a.m. I mean, for a guy in your role with such authority, you know, and now it's with Lancaster Rugby, I mean, what does a typical day look like in the life of Stuart Lancaster? <laughs> Depends on the day, but uh, that was after the gym. I text you. <laughs> Didn't want to text you too early. <laughs> uh, no, no. So I'm usually up. Um, so we've got Saturday, Saturday turnaround. Um, so we've got a, a game on Saturday and a game the following Saturday. Uh, the Sunday is very much in the office, really. Um, sort of reviewing the game, preparing the preview of the opposition that's coming up around the corner, uh, having a good think about how I'm going to sort of deliver the message and the learnings from the game. Um, I'll probably take in four or five other games as well and try and pick up any insights I've got from trends in the game on the Sunday. Um, Leo would be in, we'd be discussing selection for the following week because we'd like to get the side out on the Monday. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'd leave the office five, six o'clock. Bear in mind, you know, my family live in the UK and I'm living in Dublin. So um, it's, uh, I'm not missing Sunday lunch. <laughs> Um, because I'm on my own. Uh, so, so I'll stay and do the work. It's front loaded the work of the week for me. Um, Monday, as I say, I'm up half five in the gym at six uh, in the office for quarter seven, seven. Uh, everyone's in by then for sure. Um, and we're obviously finalizing selection. We're discussing the content of the reviews who's going to do what, who's going to present what. And typically, I'll uh, lead off on the review of the game. Leo would have had what's called a roots meeting, a leadership meeting before that, just to talk through any challenges we faced last week and what were the learnings we took as a leadership group, as in like the players. Excuse me. And then and then uh, um, we go into units, uh, unit meetings, and we turn the page to the opposition who we're going to play on the Monday afternoon. Uh, we do the preview. Um, Leo gets the team out. So he's been round, um, got the... Debrief from the medical team, um, decided on selection, told the players. And the Monday afternoon is about the preview of the opposition, but also the strike plays and the type of set piece, you know, attack we're going to use for this particular week. And we'll walk through those and then we'll train. Um, and then usually after the, that, on a Monday, it will be uh, reviewing training, preparing for the Tuesday session, session design, thinking about training numbers, what I want to get out of the session on Tuesday in addition to Monday. Um, drop in the shops on the way home, pick up some food, make some tea, watch training, go to bed, repeat. It's almost like military style in terms of application and execution. And Stuart, well, I think you have to. I think you have to. I mean, when when you're in a in a club environment, um, one of the you know one of the bigger clubs, the games come with such frequency. You know, um, you get very few weekends off. Um. I mean, football must be even 10 times worse because you've got Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday. But uh, so, yeah, you've got to, the players expect a routine, you know, you've got to deliver on on the routine. You know, if you don't deliver on point in terms of your preview or review, you turn up to a meeting not prepared, then it shows straight away. So, yeah, you have to work hard. Uh, but as the week goes on, gradually the players get more ownership and they begin to drive things themselves. And then your mind turns to the next game, which is the one the week after. Do you know what I mean? So you're starting to prep for that. So it's it's never ending, really. No, but it's it's an interesting one because the caveat I want to draw it yourself, you know, with someone especially like you, Stuart, that's so big on learning and development and research. And as you spoke about every Sunday, is a chance to look at trends in the modern game and see where the world game of rugby is going. I mean, where do you get to carve out that room for growth and continuous learning whilst working for a high performing team? 
Uh, well, I've always had that sort of growth mindset. I've always had the desire to want to get better. So I don't waste too much time, if I'm being honest. Um, again, I'm probably lucky in one way, but not so in another. I live away from my family. You know, it's it's not ideal, the fact, you know, we live apart. Um, but it does give me some free time in evenings where normally I'd be doing other things potentially. So the sacrifice has been big, but the benefit um, in terms of growth and ability to study and think and reflect and learn uh, has been good. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, um, but if I was at home and you know and I came back, I'd probably still find the time anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not a big one for like you know relaxing for the TV, watching something that I've got not much interest in. I'll always try and find something to watch. That that has a uh, something that's you know going to help me develop. It could be a Netflix series, it could be a you know a Last Dance type thing or whatever. Um, and also, I'll be quite an avid reader um, of books, so I'll always be searching whether it be sports and autobiographies, leadership um, books, um, people from other sport who've talked about success or failure. You know, I'll always be drawn to those sorts of things or podcasts as well. I'm usually driving from the uh, from the home to the airport or whatever, so they'd be quite a good a good source as well. And one of the stints of your career that I'd like you to that I'd like to bring you back to was that before you took the Leinster job in 2016, because he's as he spoke about Stuart, you indeed did leverage um, the voices of other industry leaders outside sports, outside experiences. You spent quite a period of time didn't you in other sports visiting the likes of Atlanta Falcons the FA even uh, Dave Brailsford's team GP cycling yeah I mean I think people sort of assume that that just happened at the end of like the England role but actually one of the benefits of doing the England role is that you you got to meet these people because you were the England coach um, but even prior to that when I was coaching England Saxons when I was doing the academy job I was very well supported by some really good coach developers and they were always putting us in front of different sports and getting us to think and concentrate on different aspects of leadership, management, coaching from all walks of life. So it's always, again, it's always been probably part of my development. Um, so that period between leaving England and joining Leinster, it was just a natural extension. It made sense to me. Like, I'm not going to sit at home and wait for the phone to ring. I'm not going to sit at home and play golf. I'm going to sit at, I'm going to get off my backside and I'm going to try and learn and develop and pass on what I've learned. You know, that's the, it's the best way to move on. And obviously, as you spoke about there yourself, I mean, it's obvious, it's always changing, and it's always adapting. I mean, for those leaders in sport nowadays, Stuart, be it whatever, rugby, football, cycling, I mean, what's the biggest challenge facing leaders in these modern days? Uh, staying ahead, I'd say. I mean, certainly a team like Leinster, you know, there's a, the performance, one's clock analogy where you've got a team at its peak at 12 o'clock, a team at its lowest point at 6 o'clock, um, and you're always working around this clock at, at different points. And, you know, Leinster, we'd be, you know, we've won 10 games out of 10 this season. Um, we've been reasonably successful the last two or three years, albeit we didn't win last year. Um, but we're there or thereabouts. So, but then how do you keep staying ahead? Because everyone's watching you, studying you, uh, wanting to catch up and overtake you. Um highly motivated to beat you. So I think the staying ahead piece for me at a, at a team like Leinster is, is, is a big thing. Um, so constantly think about how we can improve the quality of our training, the quality of our, uh, pr the pressure we can put on the players, the habits that become ingrained. I think that's a big thing. Um, how can we share the ownership between ourselves and the players uh, in a better way? How can I keep educating the players? Bear in mind, I've been here seven years now, you know, so how does the message not get lost in well, I've heard this before, you know. That's probably the thing I think about the most. Um, how do I keep stimulating and developing a group that I've coached for such a long time? Well, funnily enough, I have heard you speak about the importance of, of that awareness clock before, I think, in relation to Sir Alex Ferguson and Man United, understanding the ebbs and flows of the life cycle of a high-performance team. But to take it back a step further, I mean, you moved into that high-performance culture at Leinster. Could you give us any insight or offerings as to how that was built in the first place? The Leinster culture. Oh, I'll say, I'll say um, obviously as the game went professional, I think Leinster evolved into very much a homegrown squad. So a lot of lads come to play with the team from 
the province of Leinster from from Dublin, obviously as well. Um, and I think my understanding before I arrived, like it was this growth in terms of like development, but Michael Checker brought a lot of toughness, I think, uh, mental toughness to the group. Joe Schmidt brought a lot of finesse and detail, and the two combined made them what they became, which was European Cup winners. Um, and then obviously Leo took over. Um, he brought his experience from being the captain of the team and his two years at Le Leicester Tigers. I came with my experience of you know England and all that I learned there. Felipe Contepomi came with his experience of playing in different clubs in, in Argentina. Robin McBride came from Wales, 14 years working with Warren Gatland. Andrew Goodman's just come from the Crusaders, from working with Scott Robertson, you know, one of the top, well, the top Super Rugby team. So, so it's it's been an accumulation of IP and knowledge that's grown over time in in a similar group of players, with only one or two dropping off at the top and one or two coming in at the bottom. So there's never been this big churn of players that often happens in teams where they lose their cohesion and their identity because the recruiting. Too many players from outside, you know what I mean? You, you never really get stability. It seems to me almost sure that it's not top down, it's not bottom up. It seems to be a healthy combination of both. It, it is, but it takes a while to get there. You know, obviously, um, it's hard to be bottom up for the players if they don't really have the sense of direction of what you're looking for as a coach. I think, you know, the coaches need to set the framework, the parameters, the understanding of how we're trying to play the game. Obviously, there's a debate that comes with that with the players. But generally, if the coaches are good, then they should be pointing the players in the right direction. And as you begin to evolve together, the players can really understand what you're trying to achieve and they begin to drive it themselves. And the same is true in terms of like how we coach the team and how the team receive information. You know, they they enjoy the, um, the routine um, of, of the week, the flow of the week. So over a period of time, um, that helps them really settle into um, picking their moments when they can show their own leadership. And obviously during the period of time as well, you've got this group of young players who are 20, 18, 19, 20 when I started, who are now 24, 25, 26, you know, and beginning to become real leaders themselves. So you've got this natural organic evolution as well because of just the maturity and the experience that players develop through playing for Ireland and for Leinster at the same time. It's interesting, Pete Carroll had a quote about that before. Uh, Pete Carroll at the Seattle Seahawks about the big picture. He's saying it's the coach's job to keep you connected. It's the coach's job to keep you as a player connected to the vision until that vision is realised. So I'm just wondering, I mean, the coach is staring the big wheel ultimately looking at that vision in the distance. But how do they keep that within the framework of constant the constant churn as he elaborated upon earlier of Saturday, Saturday, when football, Saturday, Wednesday? Well, that's the art of it, isn't it? The art of good leadership is, is I think someone described to me as leading with a telescope and a microscope. So you look at it, the detail, the day-to-day -day detail of making every day the best it can be. And then the um, the telescope piece of, right, the future of wanting to become one of the best club teams in the world to win European Cups, to achieve five stars on the shirt, to, you know, be ready for when the World Club Challenge comes around and be the best club team in the world. You know, so it's... It's all there in front of the players, you know what I mean? But you've sometimes just got to bring it to life. But you've just got to pick your moments. Like, sometimes we'd have a Friday game and then maybe um, a Sunday game. So you get a bit of a longer lead-in. So you can take a bit of breath in between the preparation for the next team into, right, let's do a little bit bigger picture thinking here. Sometimes it's a Saturday game to a Friday game, in which case we're just about getting information in just for this particular opposition this Friday, which is case in point for the game this evening. You know, we played in France on Saturday and now we've got a home game on Friday. So there hasn't been a lot of time for bigger picture stuff this week, but there will be next week. And what are the signs then, Stuart, that indicate that the culture is going in the right direction? Probably three, really, that um, um, good people want to come and join the organisation. Um, people who are in the organisation probably stay longer than they ordinarily would, you know, coaches, physios, analysts. Uh, and if people do leave, um, they say that was actually a brilliant time in my career. You know what I mean? So um, that's, I always think that's quite a simple way of trying to describe what a good culture looks and feels like, you know, like I want to be part of that team. I want to be part of that environment. I want to try and get through the academy to become part of the senior squad. Um, I want to, 
take an opportunity to join this team because I understand from what I hear, it's it's an amazing environment and a great place to work and there's good people with good values and good behaviours and they all want to work hard to win. That's Jim Collins, right? That's a great... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, his, his, his book is, is very good. Actually, yeah, the... Um, Pleasure to meet him in Denver, Colorado. So he lives he lives in uh, in Denver, and uh, uh, we went to an England training camp before the World Cup in 2015. And I emailed him his office out the blue, thinking I could try and grab a meeting with him. <laughs> anyway, I managed to do it amazingly. Um, so I had like two hours with him and his um, uh, his management team um, in his in his leadership operation in in boulder so uh yeah no um very good man very knowledgeable has mentored amazing ceos steve jobs was one of the people he mentored for example so that's sort of level he works up unbelievable and obviously it takes such an amount of time to get to that level of cohesion where you have such an inherent sense of you'd say the social capital or identity even within the squad but if we're looking at the top of that pyramid, which you shared with us before in LinkedIn, I believe, in terms of culture, identity, vision, all the way up to player-led ownership, I mean, on a time scale, how long are we looking at that if we're doing it correctly? It takes a while. It, just, it depends what environment you're in as well. Like with England, it takes longer because you're with the players less. You know, you've got 10 games a year. You've got big gaps between training camps. Um so it takes a bit longer internationally because you're not there as often. But if you at uh, that period of time, that cohesion can develop over a period of time, you know, one, two, three, four years together. Um, in a club environment, um, it depends on the maturity of the organisation that you join, really. If you've got a team with a good culture, a strong identity, um, a good sense of what their higher purpose is, you know, it takes less time, I think, Um because you've got the foundations in place, but you might inherit a team that's got none of the things. You've got no culture, no identity, no nothing. So it's going to take longer, obviously, to get to the player ownership piece or they're driving it because there's no foundation to build the team on, if that makes sense. It does, it does of course. I mean, I'd like to draw you to Pep Guardiola, in fact. Pep Guardiola, any time Man City lose, draw, but most instances, sure, that's a... There seems there's a strong identity piece because at least Man City, if they don't win, they have something to fall back on. They have the game model, they have a style of play, they have a culture within the club. They get back to the drawing board every Monday. For me, zooming out, looking at it a bit wider, I mean, you can only read, you can say, to be honest, the strength of the culture is really tested in times where there's a momentary lapse, there's a, there's a failure. Where I'm taking this back to is last May last summer when you guys got to the Champions Cup final and you narrowly lost to La Rochelle. I mean, what was the self-talk? What was the internal like within the dressing room after that defeat in May? Uh, there wasn't a lot of talk in the dressing room, to be honest. It was pretty quiet. Um, but the main bit of talking really needed to be done on the Monday because we had another game on the Saturday with the quarterfinal of the URC to come. So we needed to get through the, the pain of the defeat, the learning from the game, and move on to preparing for the next game, you know, which was difficult to do because the pain was acute. It was the last play of the game, um, a game that we were leading from start. So, um, yeah, the players are hurting. And it took a lot of thought on the Sunday by me about how to try and get through that meeting together, but come out with lessons learned um, and in a constructive way that we were going to not drag it around with us for... Forever, obviously, the scar is still there. But the best way to to heal the scar is to win the next game. And so, we talked. You know, went through the game. We went through what we did well, as we always do. What we could have done better. Um, and then we moved on, and we you know, we beat Glasgow by seventy points. Um, the problem was the following week we lost the semi final because probably the emotion of the frustration of losing the La Rochelle game got taken out in Glasgow, and then. It wasn't, it's not hugely sustainable, that sort of driver. Um, and we were just a little bit short, 5% off, let's call it, against a really talented South Africa team. And they beat us on the day, uh, probably deservedly so. Um, the players, a lot of the players left to go to New Zealand to play for Ireland against New Zealand. So they had another Everest to climb. So again, psychologically, that was tough 
for them. But obviously, they finished their season with a win, a serious win against New Zealand, which was amazing. But also, there's a group of us that still finished with a loss. So, um, fortunately, you know, one of the challenges when you've lost like that, you know, I was thinking about Liverpool and obviously losing in the league and the Champions Cup final. Um, and then a slow start to the season. We've not had that, fortunately. We've managed to be able to sort of bounce on. It's still a long way to go this season, obviously, but, you know, we've, we're have we not dragging it around. And I think that's important to caveat too. But do you think, I mean, looking widely across sports, I look at team sports, Stuart, I mean, you guys speak about playing Saturday, Saturday, football Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday, whatever. Do players on the elite levels get enough time to reflect? Um, yeah, I think they do. But you've got to create it as well yourself as a coach. So you've got to get them into a meeting and say, right, just split into groups and tell us what three things we did well, what three things we can do better. Um, individually, have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them saying, just wondering how you're getting on, anything on your mind, anything you want to discuss, both home life, you know, in terms of your career, in terms of the opportunities that you're getting or not getting. You know, so you've got to create reflection windows for the players. Um, and also you've got to educate them about how to reflect themselves, you know. So when you're switching off, are you going for a walk? Are you going through your notes? Are you setting some goals? Are you, you know, what are you, how are you studying and learning to become a better player? And part of that studying and learning is the reflection piece about how you dealt with a particular situation, how you trained, how you prepared, how you led. You know, they're all parts of the jigsaw. If we are to speak about reflection, I mean, at the end of the season, Stuart, of course, you're going to come to the end of your six and a half, seven years at Leinster to join Racing in France. I mean, what would you say has been your biggest lesson throughout your six and a half years? With the, with the... Uh, I want to learn loads. I mean, I think I said not so long ago, actually. Um, when I first came, I wrote down, someone said something in a meeting. Could be one, of, I think it was Leo. And I wrote it down. Well, that's a really interesting point. I've not thought of that. And I've kept this sort of log of lessons learned um, or things that I've reflected on. I think I'm up to about 160 now. So <laughs> I can't tell you all 160, but um, uh, I think, you know, the, the shared ownership piece is probably the biggest lesson really in terms of the power of it. Once you get to that point where you can really, they understand completely what we're trying to do as a group, what we're trying to achieve. Um, for them to own it, um, it's definitely the place to strive towards. But it's the first time, really, I've ever felt with a team of coaches that were there. Um, and it gives me great satisfaction to know that I can leave and feel that everyone's in, it's in a great place. You know what I mean? You've, and I've got to try and do it again in a different team now, which is probably going to take seven years again. The problem is it's in French. So um, it's not going to be as easy. I don't think it's going to be easy at all. Uh, but that's my goal is to see if I can achieve it in a different country with a different language and it's that that's the challenge that excites me I guess more than anything else I'm focusing on that I mean Racing what would set of circumstances sure that led you to saying yes and going all in uh, I think the way they approached me and the timing of it seven years is a long time you know in one place um, I said the job of a coach is to make themselves redundant and uh, you know I'm not saying I feel like that at Leinster but I do feel that they're in a great place and, you know, some new voices, some new energy to the group will be good for them. And for me personally, go back to a number one position. So I've been sat behind Leo for seven years. You know, I've been the England head coach. So go back to be the head coach again. Give me, put me, give me more responsibility. Um, the challenge of going into the top 14 and trying to develop a team that, that obviously has done well, but not quite achieves the success that they want. Um, They've got great young players coming through from the Racing Academy in the Parisian area. Uh, but obviously, they've got some superstars that have come in from out overseas as well. So how do you pull all that together and pull together a new management team, work with existing coaches who've been there for years, um, physios, doctors, analysts, kit men, um, try and integrate myself into the French culture, the French way of life, show the French people that I'm committed, um, try and give them a sense of what my purpose is and my personality whilst not being able to speak the language that well in, in the first instance. Um, so there's so many sort of challenges. I couldn't, I found it hard to turn down in the end because of those reasons. And they probably, 
went about it in a in a way that's not happened before, where they said, "You're our man. We don't have a plan B. We want you to come." And when someone is that um, proactive in in their approach, it does make you think. Well, maybe maybe this is the time. Maybe it all it all happens for a reason. So. We'll see. I mean, obviously, the, it's, I'm committed. I'm off. Um, so uh, I've signed a four-year deal. Um, we'll see how it goes. What I'm looking further to down the road, I mean, it is at the end of the season and all, and you touched upon it there. I mean, you haven't been a head coach in six, seven years. Is there anything from the onset that you'll do differently as opposed to last time as head coach? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm busy trying to recruit people to surround me with the managerial side of things so I don't have to concentrate on on that, so the current head coach is going to become the president. So he'll he's effectively like a director of rugby, let's call him. Um, there's a team manager there, but I'm also bringing in a general manager who's just been appointed. Um, so, you know, that sort of managerial side of things, I won't cover it off. So if there's a disciplinary hearing, then, right, GM, you go and sort that out, please, and make sure he gets off, you know, with the minimum ban as possible. Or... You know, we've got some recruitment issues to deal with, right? You guys are going to do that, right? We've got a plan in a camp. We've gone for a camp, right? You, you go deal with that because I want to concentrate on, like, the coaching sessions, the session design, the game plan, educating the players to the type of rugby I want to play, and making sure that that is ingrained inside them by the way in which a coach, so that it becomes habit and they can deliver it under pressure in the big days, home and away, both in France and in Europe. And, I mean, one other thing before we close, sure, I mean, you've been absolutely terrific these past few years, especially in mentoring countless leaders out there and providing your stuff for free at times on LinkedIn and whatnot. And I know you've run a number of seminars and educational forums over these past few years, especially during COVID. I mean, what has been the single biggest lesson that you've learned supplying the thousands en masse with this? Um, I do get, I do get a, like a real sense of enjoyment of um, sharing what I've learned. Um, probably the lesson there is that if you share, you have to work hard to stay ahead. <laughs> um, so I think that's probably been a big one for me, like just preparing, by preparing information that you're going to give out on LinkedIn or you're going to do a, a webinar on, on defense or leadership or whatever. You have to prepare properly. and You've got to articulate your thoughts in a certain way and, by doing these things, it forces you to do that. Um, and because I've had a bit of spare time on my hands, because I've not had the same, I guess, family challenges, because I, because as, as I've said, you know, we sort of flip flip between the two. Um, uh, I, yeah, I get a sense of satisfaction from doing it, um, but it forces me to think about how do I, how do I continue to grow myself as a leader? Like it's already all sharing everything, but how do you keep growing? Um, and I think that um, I've still managed to achieve that, um, which is good. And obviously, I think this next period in my career will be a tremendous growth period. And I think hopefully there'll be more lessons I can share on the back of it. You know, no, not everyone is going to leave Ireland or England or the UK and go to live in France like I am. But there'll definitely be some lessons about uh, integrating into a new culture, into a new environment. And I'll make some mistakes probably, but... Um, I think I'll probably learn a lot, which I think will be worth sharing. Never ending journey of growth and development. And I think that's an attestment to yourself as a person, your career to date. And, you know, the, that was one of the very f first reasons I was, you know, intrigued to learn more about you in the first place a few years ago, Stuart, too, because you took an awful lot of your learnings from outside the rugby domain, such as Bill Walsh, American football, Dan Quinn, Atlanta Falcons, Dave Ralesford, Team GP, so on and so forth. And I think in football, we can be guilty of that far too often that folks and, you know, too narrow within the industry when there's a lot of leadership to be ascertained from outside and lessons from other industries, no other than football, so to speak of. But I mean, to close... I think on that, I think one thing that the FA, English FA did really well, they set up a technical advisory board that I sit on, which is all with people from outside of football. And I think Gareth Southgate, he lives about 20 miles away from me in Harrogate. Um, and we were very similar uh, in that he got interim job as coach of England. I was interim coach of England rugby. Um, we were both quite young coaches. We both tried to change the culture and the environment, the way we did things. Um, fortunately, you know, the FA kept and stuck with him and, you know, he's gone on to do, you know, a lot of good things with the team. Um, 
but I think he's really open-minded in that regard. Um, and uh, I do think, you know, I love watching the, you know, the Amazon Prime, um, you know, the all or nothings in football and everything else. Um, but you'd love to go into a football environment as well, wouldn't you? Just to sort of like really ask the questions, well, why do you do this or why do you do that? Um, have you not thought about doing it this way? Now, I've been lucky at that. I've been in quite a few. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it works both ways. There's a huge amount, the pressure, the expectation on these managers and the players within professional football, but equally, there's a lot of football I think could learn from from other sports as well, for sure. In fact, I don't know if you're watching it. Um, I think I think you may be. In fact, you mentioned that on a previous podcast, Last Chance You, season yeah, two yeah. came out a few days ago. Uh, Coach John Mosley yeah, yeah, yeah. of yeah. East uh, Los Angeles Community College. I'm speaking to him at the moment with a view to get them on the podcast following in your footsteps, Stuart. But I, oh, very good. These little series are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I enjoy all of those. Um, and uh, um, there's always a little snippet you can take from each and every one, can't you? 100% because there are just so many different circumstances. And what I find is at the end of the day, though, you zoom out and we are all asking as coaches and leaders universal questions, wherever the answers are subjective and they're individual. You're unique to your very domain, your expertise, your circumstance, your location, which is absolutely like that's the fascinating piece about it to me. Yeah. You know, working yeah. in so many different cultures this year between North America and the Middle East and Europe, it's just been it's been enlightening for me as a whole. Yeah. So, with that being said, to close out the podcast, here, I mean, thanks so much again for coming on. It's some invaluable insight from the world of rugby. I mean, what advice would you have for those coaches listening that wish to own and wish to improve upon their leadership? Uh, I think I think you have to love you have to love what you do. Um, I think that um, when I finished with England, you know, I went away and had a good thing about, well, actually, what do I really enjoy about working in teams? You know, some people might be driven more towards the leadership part, you know, being a, a manager. Some people might be more uh, interested in analysis or data or recruitment or whatever. Um, but my passion really, born back to my teaching days, was actually I just love being outside coaching. Um, this study in the game so so find your passion I think would be number one within the team environment develop yourself you know always believe you can um, get better and, and you can always improve by being tough on yourself and looking in the mirror first at yourself there's a lot of people in sport very quick to point fingers and say why didn't you do this or should have done that or could have done this you know, I think you've got to look at yourself first and say, right, what well, can I do better? Um, and I think um, have that never-ending desire to to get better and don't give yourself a full stop. <laughs> don't give yourself a, right, I'm going to get to 50 or I'm going to get to 60. Or I'm going to, like, stop coaching. I'm like, my wife says to me, um, uh, what do you what do you think? You've got a few of your mates who are thinking about retiring. I'm like, I'm just getting started. <laughs> There's a long way to go. There's a long way to go. It's all part of the rel of the relentless grind that is high performance sport. But I mean, Stuart, hopefully we can get you on for a round two for some French reflections in a few years. <laughs> I say French lessons there. Jeez. <laughs> no, I'm struggling to speak English as it is. <laughs> Stuart, thanks so yeah. much for coming on. No problem. Thanks.